Well, hello there, friends. Welcome to tomorrow. This week, we've got some exciting news on the docket. You voted, we listened, we are going to talk about Strata Launch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also, Blue Origin launched recently, and they actually recorded it. They are one step closer to sending us flesh bags into space. We're going to talk all about that, plus more, here on Tomorrow Orbit 12.04. Good morning. How's everything up in the sky? And hello there, friends. Some real quick introductions. My name is Jade. I am your resident person sitting in a chair talking to you at the camera. Um, this here's Jared. He is our astronomer in residence of tomorrow. I've got here a Carrie Ann. And of course, she's the voice of the community as well as our resident Ben Wrangler. Mm. And of course, our lovely Lisa, our science specialist. So um, we're just gonna go ahead and dive right on into it. So um, you, you folks voted about uh, what you'd like us to discuss up here, and mm -hmm. it looks like strata launch is something that's on a lot of people's minds. Yeah, so it's 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 really been a big news item uh, the past couple of weeks um, with everything going on with it, just because there's been like some big shifts and and other things happening with it. So, so what happened? Uh, well, you know, strata launch was announced in December of 2011, and if you don't know what strata launch is, it was a venture by Paul Allen and Bert Rutan mm -hmm. uh, that really actually started in 2010, um, and it's a carrier aircraft, and that carrier aircraft is the biggest part of the strata launch system. Um, and if I recall correctly, it's actually the biggest airplane that's ever been made in by terms wingspan. of by wingspan. Yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah, we're not talking about what was the one the the loosey goosey, the sprucey goose, the spruce goose, right? Because that, yeah. that one was like that Hard was right, right, right. <laughs> that yeah. was a totally different thing. The nice thing is that. Um, <laughs> So uh, what Ben did, in case you missed it, uh, there was actually a, a news section of like what we would normally do on the show of just presenting, mm -hmm. and Ben kind of took that out of the show and put that in its own thing. So, but you guys voted on it, which is really amazing. And yeah. so, like Jade said, we listened to what you said, and we have the news that uh, that Ben presented, and then we're talking a little bit more about you know our opinions on on the strata launch sort of situation. One of the questions that I had specifically was the strata launch, the whole deal was that you have this huge plane, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And then you've got the rocket that essentially like drops down from it and then continues to, exactly. to launch. Like, ver like yeah. Right, an uh, air Galactic. launch, right? Yeah. So, like Virgin Galactic, that yeah. was exactly what I was, was Origi say. Originally Let's in 2011, they actually had a specifically designed uh, SpaceX Falcon rocket that they were gonna use called Falcon Air, which is only gonna have four engines um, and it was gonna do about 6,000 kilometers kilograms to orbit. Mm -hmm. So that was that was their original plan, but then they cut ties in 2012 with SpaceX and said, we're going to go do our own thing. Um, and uh, they started to work with orbital sciences to develop a new type of rock, rocket called the Pegasus II. Mm -hmm. um, and then that... Orbital uh, sciences, which became orbital ATK, K, which, which became, became uh, Space Division of Northrop Grumman. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Orbital ATK, right. a space yeah. division of Northrop Grumman. But so like, why <laughs> I would I... So like Virgin Galactic, or sorry, Virgin Orbital. Orbit kind yeah. Of thing. So is this like a is this a viable option for launching small payloads? Like, because I feel mm -hmm. like if Strata Launch was already doing this way back in the day, like why aren't they already doing it now? Exactly. See what I'm saying? And or like why isn't Virgin Orbit already doing it by now? Then see what I mean? Well, I suppose it's just timelines. You know, Virgin Orbit starting from scratch mm -hmm. uh, with what they had. Strata Launch was trying to start from scratch, but they didn't end up succeeding all that well. So now they've actually gone to uh, the Pegasus XL vehicle, which is which is a launch vehicle that's already in. It's already flying. Uh, they usually attach it to a Lockheed. Uh, I can't remember the name of it. It's a L1011. L1011. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Nice. Um, and they attach it to the bottom and then they release it and it sends its payload off into orbit. And you can do low Earth orbit equatorial, uh, you could do sun synchronous orbit with it. Um, and really the advantage of air launch is that you can hit any launch azimuth or any launch direction that you want to um, because you don't have to launch from like say Vandenberg. Mm -hmm. You can mm -hmm. actually go out over the ocean 
like a thousand miles to the west of Vandenberg Air Force Base, and then launch from there. So and that's, that's advantageous. But that's exactly my question. So, mm -hmm. like, uh, actually, Daniel Palmer off of YouTube uh, in the chat room says, "Strata is dead. It failed. Uh, it failed the end. Moving on." Um, it failed the end. Sorry, I was trying to like read it and not reading it correctly. Um, yeah. But that's the thing. Like, okay, so it sounds like a great idea. Why hasn't this happened? And why hasn't orbit like? Is it money? Is money. It, yeah. I mean, yeah. You, you, and also Paul development. Allen didn't have not money though. And development time too. Um, you know, Strata Launch tried to develop their own rocket through someone else. Mm -hmm. to work with it. It just didn't end up working out. So, and that's they had this grand plan too, to not just have one type of rocket, but they they were having multiple types of medium. Um, class launch vehicles that they wanted to do, and they even had plan uh, plans to do a space plane. And so I guess I don't know. I don't want to be like, oh, that's their downfall because they decided they wanted to branch out, and then once they split their resources over all these different variants, yeah, like look how cool that is. I mean, it's yeah. cool, right? Yeah. But if you can't even develop like you know your first launcher that you can start putting payloads on and earning money. What, what's the point of, of diverging and trying to build a space plane and a medium class and a heavy class and a like medium and a half class because you're just spending all these resources to do multiple things and not getting any money for it? it. What's, what's the phrase, <coughs> uh, jack of all trades means you're a master of none? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, yeah. That sort of idea? And now they've had to compromise by going back to Pegasus XL. And the thing about Pegasus XL it's is that expensive. it's expensive. I can it's go 50 put, million. I right? can put my payload on a Virgin Orbit Launcher 1 for one fifth of the cost and mm -hmm. still get the same amount of weight into whatever orbit I want to put it in. Right. So why would I go to Strata Launch and end mm -hmm. up doing that? So Beff says, uh, look, Paul Allen also died, and that's a big yes. thing. He was yeah. funding it personally. Yeah. Exactly. So, like, yeah, the, like, so what's What's happening now? Like, what are exactly? Do we think that this is going to be a thing? Because they continue to have, like, even just last year, last month. No, this month, this month, right? Earlier this month, they were like, yeah, hey, we got the, like the fastest. Uh, oh yeah, they did a taxi test. Yeah, a taxi test down the runway. Mm -hmm. They even oh, see, there you go. They even got the uh, the wheels slightly that off of the ground for a hot minute. Huge. It is huge. There's like there's no semi truck for you know to see how big it is. But yeah, it's big. <laughs> so, so I mean, do we think that that's going to be, do we think that's going to be a thing? See what I'm saying? I mean, I want to believe in Strata Launch because I think the plane is really cool and I know they've spent many years and, and a lot of funds trying to make it happen, but like, I think the fact that they keep, you know, chopping and changing what they're going to put underneath, you know, and working with different companies and then trying to do their own thing and then going back to the Pegasus XL, like, when you keep chopping and changing like that, I don't think it bodes well for your company's future mm -hmm. rather than just kind of you know sticking down the one development path because every time you have to restart again like that's wasted hours wasted time wasted money you know and wasted talent sure so, mm -hmm. so uh lucen groden i apologize if i'm butchering that name off of youtube says uh why is stratalodge manned couldn't it fly higher if it was automated Actually, I don't know that it is piloted. Um, it is piloted. Okay. Uh, one of the things is that uh, obviously you are limited in how much weight you can carry, and you also have to carry that fuel up mm -hmm. as well for mm -hmm. your rocket. And, is the Pegasus and, XL a solid or a liquid? Yes, Pegasus XL is solid. So, hmm. um, Well, there's a couple of advantages there compared to Virgin Orbit then, because Virgin Orbit, it's doing air launch as well, except its rocket, the uh, Launcher 1, is like it's liquid fueled, right? Mm -hmm. so you've got to take your cryogenics up there, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, that, there's a whole other level of complexity there because you know you've got to mm -hmm. try and keep it cold. Or you've got to worry about boil off, and I think the way that Virgin is doing it is they're going to fuel on the ground, fully fueled with um, your liquid propellant and oxidizer. They're going to fly up, and then anything that boils off, they're just going to let it boil off on the way. But then, mm -hmm. as composed, uh, does it uh, actually get that? Solid. Does the does the plane itself actually get that high? Then? I'm like, am I un misunderstanding something? Like, you only have to get so high, right? And then the rocket just drops and goes on its own. Well, like there's only so high you can go before your wings stop generating exactly. lift. Exactly. Okay. Um, especially if you're trying to carry the weight of a rocket up yeah. to altitude. I think I think with Strata Launch and uh, Virgin Orbit, it's basically 40 to 50,000 feet in that regime there. That's a nice regime because it gets you above most of the weather mm -hmm. uh, that you would have to worry about. Mm -hmm. So you get a nice smooth deployment and a nice smooth initial uh, launch with it. Also, you've got a thinner atmosphere, so your rocket 
pocket has a little bit of an energetic advantage, so it doesn't have as much friction uh, to contend with. And then also, you know, you can get your plane up at a little bit higher of a speed, which means you get that extra oomph of speed from your plane as well. Um, so it gives you gives you just a slight advantage in all three of those areas over, say, like a, a ground launch. Um, but I don't. We're <laughs> we're very far and away from having like uh, like very like medium to heavy orbital class rockets being carried by aircraft. Well, so. Andy yeah. Cowley in the YouTube chat says just put a space shuttle under it. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that'll do it. That's fine. So. Although John Ellis responds with, uh, "Yeah, you're thinking of launching a Dream Chaser from Strata Launch, Andy Cowley." Yeah. Oh, well, that would be cool. That yeah. would be really cool. I think cool. that there was actually a plan to potentially use Dream uh, Straddle Launch as a Dream Chaser launcher. So, interesting. Yeah. Baby shuttle under a gigantic space plane. That would be the, yeah. like the cutest space it, launch right? ever. It, it, you know, it's really funny because the shuttle. One of the transport options that they were developing for it back in the day was was uh, two C five galaxies attached to each other, huh. and it looked it looks a lot like the straddle launch uh, carrier does. Mm -hmm. so, so really, the idea is not that fast. Just tape it together. So, ah! so yeah, just you know, just some duct tape. Yes. Yeah, so, all right. Blue. Really quickly. Nice. So so, yeah. uh, so what's going on with Blue Origin? That was oh. other like big news Ooh, this week, right? Blue. Yeah, they had their uh, their tenth flight of New Shepard, mm -hmm. um, and it was carrying eight different uh, science payloads for NASA. We got the launch here. Let's check it out. Two, one. Oh, I love that drone shot. That's so cool. Dude, any drone shot seems to be just freaking awesome. Well, I mean, yeah, that's true as well. Um, so uh, these eight NASA science payloads got to fly because of the NASA Flight Opportunities Program, which uh, I th feel like I'd heard of before, but I didn't actually realize. Um, the good thing is, is they got to have their payloads back because this is a reusable <laughs> rocket. My gosh, I love that shot, that tracking shot of it coming down right at you. It's just so wobbly. It's also, yeah, <laughs> scary. Uh, Look at that thing. Uh, 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 it's headed right for us. <laughs> that is magnificent. Where's the rocket? I feel like oh, that would is. be more comfortable, so. like, <laughs> in this capsule because, you know, it's kind of like the Soyuz where it has the, you know, retro fire thrusters that, like, <laughs> Make this side of dust to make you touch down at like one mile per hour or something. Right, 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 right. And I, I so know that this and Soyuz is the kind of the same and they and they look the same as they're coming down, but this one just feels like it would be a smoother ride. Yeah, it mm -hmm. just looks nicer. Yeah, compared so. to Soyuz coming down. Also, Maybe, more know. room inside of it too. And giant so. windows. Yes. Yeah, huge, lots of room. Yeah. <laughs> lots of room. And yeah, huge windows. Those windows are like this. They're gigantic. I think they have the record for like the largest windows um, that have, you know, at least passed the common line. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I very much like Those windows are bigger than most cars. Yeah. That's like, very true. You know what I'm saying? Like, sincerely, the windows yeah. are like this big. Yeah. Like, I, you can go on cruise ships with smaller windows. Like, I, yeah. I, they're huge. Yeah. They're absolutely dynamic. Yeah, I mean, the windows on the cupola of the International Space Station are pretty big. Oh, um, yeah, but, but these windows are bigger than those, if you can, like, imagine that. Right, I mean, we've right. all seen the, perspective. If you haven't seen the images from the cupola before, like, Google International Space Station cupola, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful mm -hmm. thing that they added onto it. Um, and, yeah, those windows are big, but compared to Blue or the New Shepard windows, they are tiny. Those okay. things are... <laughs> Like you could literally like go up right into it, you know, and look at it. So uh, maybe it's like maybe it's like flying a Dreamliner, you know. Like when you fly a Dreamliner for the first time, one of the things you notice is like, whoa, this window's big, you know, because right? <laughs> they're bigger than other airplanes' exactly. windows out there. So, so yeah. the payloads on board got a fantastic view as well, um, and there were eight. They all have acronym names, so like I do, <laughs> I do have a cheat sheet here because here we go. Yeah, who is going to memorize? Who's going to memorize the eight? The eight uh, acronyms. Well, actually, well, we don't uh, do acronyms here. Uh, exactly. So, so I have to explain yeah. them all. Um, <laughs> So my, my favorite one was uh, the, they have a model propellant gorging experiment. Basically, um, they're trying to solve a problem here where if you are in space and you've got your propellant in, in your tank, so you need to know how much propellant you have in the tank because if you st try to start your engine and maybe all the propellants are not back down at the end where the uh, engine is and you get, you know, uh, not a, the right amount of propellant flowing into your engine, you're going to have problems. And you also need to know how much is left because you don't really have, you know, you can't go to a gas station in space and top up yeah. yet. Yes, so, um, we're working on that. The, the way that this experiment works is they take sound and they use sound to try and, they um, send sound waves into the tank 
and they get to see whether the fuel is sloshing around everywhere or whether it's actually settled down at the bottom of the tank where you mm. want it to be. That's cool. Um, yeah. So they use the little piezoelectric sensors on the sides of the tank, take multiple measurements, and then you know how much is in your tank and where the location of the fuel actually is. Nice. That's kind of like uh, when we measure when we use uh, earthquakes to measure the interior of the Earth. Yeah. So uh, where we use the seismic waves traveling through the Earth in the different times that they arrive at different places on the Earth to figure out the interior structure. So that's really cool. Yeah. So, I didn't oh even God. realize it was yeah. similar to that. Yeah. yeah, and you know, that's what InSight's doing on Mars as yeah, exactly. well with its single size monitor. Wow, it's so. like nature knows what it's doing or something. Yeah, like, what? In, and huh? we just copy what they're doing. Yeah, and it's like, it's like, science. We, it's like <laughs> we know physics or something. So weird. Yeah. So, I don't that's know. That's funny. <laughs> um, they also had a vibration isolation platform. So I guess if you're doing science, you don't want the vibrations of the rocket to actually mess up uh, what you think your experiment is doing. So this mm -hmm. platform is, <laughs> stays like bolted to the structure of the spacecraft while it's like taking off and going through through the high G parts of launch, but as soon as they reach microgravity, the platform detaches, and then the experiment can just kind of float around in its own little huh. inertial um, frame of reference, and then you don't have to worry about the nice. off vibrations getting in the way. It's an so. experiment in a box. <laughs> a floating so. box. A floating box. Oh, wow. wow. Um, there was another experiment <laughs> that looked at um, the electromagnetic field inside and on the outside of New Shepard, which Ooh. used just commercial off-the-shelf sensors to measure the electric and magnetic fields, mm -hmm. um, and apparently, um, what they think is cool is if you get everybody starting to do suborbital or orbital launches and you put these um, magnetic field sensors like on the outside of the spacecraft, once the frequency of everyone doing suborbital and orbital launches expands from multiple points around the globe, you can use these measurements to take almost like a global snapshot of what the Earth's magnetic field is doing. Cool. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, you guys might have like heard rumors of, you know, the Earth's magnetic poles are going to like flip over soon. We didn't actually understand enough um, about the global magnetic field structure to be able to predict when or whether that's even going to happen. But this might be a way to get enough data to kind of make that decision. Yeah, and it might help us figure out things too, like the South Atlantic anomaly that uh, that you know when spacecraft fly through it, like Hubble. You know, you, uh, that's an area where the magnetic field really drops down, and you get a lot more exposure to cosmic radiation mm -hmm. in that area. No, ex no real solid explanation for it yet. But I mean, like when Hubble flies through it, they can't take data um, because it just basically overloads the, the systems on board. So it may help us figure out that. So. Interesting. Yeah. Cool stuff. Yeah, really cool. Um, they had a, a, an experiment that was originally on ISS that take, basically just takes photos of um, plants that have fluorescent proteins in them. Mm -hmm. So um, mm. the plants are going to glow a certain color, and they have these cameras that automatically take photos of the plants at certain points over the microgravity flight. Um, they just had to fix the timing on those so that uh, they could take the time uh, at the right time because suborbital is a very different environment to being on the ISS. Mm -hmm. um, so that was pretty cool. Uh, we have another one that's like looking at, uh, um, think about like a PC computer and it gets like really hot. And like if you're a gamer, potentially maybe you have a water cooling system in your PC. Mm -hmm. Well, the next step up um, from that is something called embedded cooling where instead of like flowing water through your PC to cool it, um, you actually flow uh, a non-conductive fluid through like the, um, the, the boards themselves to cool it down. Mm -hmm. You can't do that with water because if the water leaked everywhere, all your computer boards would like get fried. Mm -hmm. the, yeah, it's not yeah. good. <laughs> bad news, water in electronics <laughs> doesn't work Especially very well. Especially in spacecraft, that's Well bad. then how do they clean it? I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, wow. <Go> <laughs> And the problem with this is that it's a two-phase flow, which means that there is oh. the, the liquid phase, and then um, it actually changes state to a gas, and that's how it removes the heat from the system and oh. keeps the electronics cool. Except we don't know enough about how that happens in microgravity to know if is the gas and the liquid going to flow exactly the same way that you huh. expect. So that experiment is, is basically boiling this non-conductive fluid through some electronics that are really warm and seeing like how it actually cools the electronics and whether it flows how it's supposed to and whether we can use that to cool down electronics on spacecraft. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And, um, you know, maybe what we, are we can... What are we using right now to cool everything down? Um, usually it depends. Like, a lot of spacecraft use uh, radiators to get rid mm -hmm. of a lot mm -hmm. of their waste heat. Um, yeah, the International Space Station uses uh, ammonia as their uh, their heat transfer fluid. Got so, it. Yeah. 
So, so they pump ammonia through uh, through these massive radiators that then go through uh, parts of the space station where heat's exchanged and then dumped overboard. Um, although they've now been the a little. The Russian side uses water. So yes. Yeah. yeah. The Russian side uses water, so it's a, a combo of those two. Got and it. there's been a couple times uh, where the ammonia pump on board of the International Space Station's actually failed, and then they have Ooh. to go out and fix it. Um, yeah. So yeah. pack away at it. Yeah. You know, get your hammers. <laughs> Got it. Hammer and sawzall, and just go outside real quick. So. Um, they're also <laughs> testing a, another type of green propellant. Um, it's called AFM315E. Great name. Yeah, good um, name. <laughs> but it's 45% uh, denser than hydrazine. It has a greater ISP. Um, and because it's denser and it actually freezes at a lower temperature, it, you don't need to keep it you don't need to worry about keeping it as cold as something like hydrazine. It's also not as like terribly toxic as hydrazine. Yeah. Um, yeah, if you if you start breathing the fishy smell of hydrazine, uh, you're in danger. It's not safe to really yeah. breathe that. <laughs> I've heard I've heard the old joke, which is that uh, they say hydrazine smells like fish, but nobody's lived long enough to confirm it. So. Oh, oh man. if you smell so. it, it's too late. Yeah. That's sad. Is yeah. that like a true thing though? Like once you smell it, like that's it. Like oh, like I don't know. I think I've never. It's very I don't really want to be a part no, of this. No, but you know what I mean. Like that's, that's <laughs> very sci-fi sort of like it touched me. Like oh, you're doomed. Yeah, like, that that's kind of it. Thing? You're done. <laughs> right? Interesting. I mean, I understand the hydrazine's not good, and I, I also understand that we have like electronic smellers that can like analyze what you know and be able to tell us what it does smell like. Mm -hmm. um, but I, yeah, I'm I'm wondering. Just had just had a curiosity. Yeah. Well, if you know, leave us a comment. You know, if anyone yeah. has. If, if you've ever smelt it. If you've huffed hydrazine before, leave us a comment below. We're not and tell us what it this. Like. No, yeah. no, not Don't huff go out and just... do it. Um, I wouldn't recommend what it. Have you um, oh yeah, tickle stuff asks face. what smells like almonds. I don't remember. Cyanide, uh, right? Is it cyanide? I think oh, it's cyanide. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. don't ask me how I know this. <laughs> no. so. Nope, Beth answered cyanide. Oh. Whoops, okay. sorry, that was the wrong thing. Don't mind. <laughs> I'm not pushing that one anymore. Okay, uh, cool. So um, what else do we have? We were talking about, um, I apologize, I totally lost the chat room for a hot minute. I'm yeah. sure some of you also had uh, some issues with that. So I was, that's why I was so quiet for a while. I was trying to do all of those sorts of things. Um, opportunity, that's what we were talking yeah. about. Mm -hmm. um, Poor Oppie. Our favorite, so. our favorite memories of opportunity. So the thing is that like, uh, we were talking a little bit before the show, Ben was like, you know, your favorite memories of opportunity. and. Quite frankly, I was like, why are we doing this? And he's like, well, because, you know, most likely opportunity is gone. And I said, sure, but most likely opportunity has been gone for weeks now. This feels like... Months. Like literally half a year. Yeah. So. No pun intended, but it feels like a dead story. Um, oh, so I was trying soon. to figure out, like, why <laughs> why we were doing it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure, especially my planetary people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That you guys have some some fond memories and of plus, Oppie yeah, in general. Yeah, R.I.P. Oppie. We haven't had so. like an official goodbye. Yeah, like, not Kind of like with Cassini. Or they like, are, that's true. So they are still trying to get in contact with Opportunity, mm -hmm. uh, the, one of the Mars exploration, the only Mars exploration rover that had, that had been operating up until the middle of last year, 2018. Um, now they're looking for signals both in X-band and S-band being transmitted at the same time from from the antennae, multiple antennae that are on uh, Opportunity, and they're basically doing like what they call a sweep and beep, which is they're tr basically trying to find it as much as they can. At this point, they think the internal clocks are so out of sync uh, that that it may not that it may actually have battery power once it gets once the solar panels get blown off. But the oh. clocks are so out of sync that it's not gonna it's not gonna go. Hey, I should wake up right now. You oh, know? interesting. So it may actually just stay like a zombie state on the surface of Mars where it's awake, but it's not communicating. Is so, there a way to exactly. sync that up? Uh, no, it has to do it itself. So, so yeah. in theory, if we got a human over there, they also could yes. not tinker it? Uh, to well, make it go? No, they should be able to tinker with okay. it to make it happen. So just curious. Uh, yeah, so we could. I don't know. I don't have any special plans. It, Wait, know? can so. we send Mars twenty twenty over with like a USB stick and like plug that into like? That would be great, but I that's like, like, this like one. that's like a <laughs> thousand kilometers traverse in order yeah. to pull that off. Oh. So so that might be a little difficult. So. Um, but, you know, that dust storm that, that killed Opportunity, or presumably killed Opportunity, was the, the biggest and most vicious dust storm uh, in at least recorded history that we've had so far. Oh, these graphics are crazy. Um, yeah, yeah, this is the propagation of dust across Pretty the surface violent. of Mars. Um, and you know that dust storms here on Earth are rather localized. You know, they, you get some dust coming off of the Sahara, it may make it over to the Amazon, but it really doesn't get all that far on Mars because of the thin atmosphere. 
dust is able to get carried all over the place uh, and literally envelop the entire planet in a, a choking uh, layer of dust in the atmosphere. And that's essentially what happened. The dust cut off the sunlight, and then Opportunity, which runs on solar panels, uh, was not able to generate enough power, and it went into a low voltage state, and it basically turned itself off to preserve itself. Um, and uh, it would have probably stayed on with its heaters on. Mm -hmm. um, I also found out about this, I didn't know this until last year, which is that there's actually little uh, pieces of uranium inside of, uh, inside of Opportunity that act as like a heat, a like backup heater um, huh. in case the actual heaters uh, die. It's not like a lot of heat. It's like just barely enough to keep yeah. opportunity above d the temperature of death uh, for it. Um, and then also some, they were hoping advantageously that in dust storms, because there's material there to actually be condu thermally conductive, uh, it actually gets a little warmer when a dust storm happens. Mm -hmm. so they were hoping that would have kept uh, opportunity a little bit warmer as well, but haven't heard from it, so. Got it, but know, say it wakes so. up, you know, with all of the experiments currently going on, or all of the kind of science currently going on Mars, mm -hmm. if it wakes up, what data, I guess what I'm asking is, is it worth the data that it would send back? Yes, absolutely. So having a having an operational rover on the surface of Mars is super important. Their uh, opportunity and curiosity were basically our geologists that exactly. were on the surface mm -hmm. of Mars. Um, you know, sure, a geologist could do what those rovers did in about 15 minutes, um, <laughs> but at the same time, Don't tell them those that. geologists aren't there right now. Exactly. So this is what we've got. Uh -huh. um, and this is Endeavor Crater, uh, or excuse me, Endurance Crater, uh, where Opportunity was at. Um, and uh, very large crater. Uh, you know, you could see it, the rim of it. The, other, the rim of it on the other side, far off in the distance, um, and it was basically looking at an area where water had been flowing uh, for mm -hmm. very long periods of time before it died. Um, but. Um, but there's some really great memories that I have of Opportunity, such as its landing, when it landed in yes. January of 2004, um, using that airbag system. And it just so happened that it bounced across the surface and then rolled into a crater. So we literally launched it from Earth. It traveled you know, hundreds of millions of kilometers to Mars, bounced on the surface, and then it rolled right into a crater. Uh -huh. that's, like, that's like the best hole in one in golf you could <laughs> exactly. ever think of. Exactly. Wow. So. Yes. I remember that day like it was yesterday. I was in the sixth grade. Mr. Benedetto, fantastic <laughs> teacher. He was so just, like, he had so much passion for NASA and space exploration, which as mm -hmm. a kid I didn't quite appreciate as much as I would have now. Sure. But I remember we watched it. We watched simulations on the NASA website in the computer lab. Mm -hmm. And I remember even as a little kid, like, this can't be real. Like, I thought it was just watching, like, a, this could happen someday in the future. It's like, right, no, 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 right. no, this is going to happen. And it happened. Yeah. So, yeah. It's like, I think we all kind of experienced that when we were kind of, well, a lot younger, obviously, Steve yeah. three, but. <laughs> um, And the thing about uh, Opportunity is that a couple weeks beforehand, Spirit had landed. And those, t those twin Mars exploration rovers, the entirety of their mission was basically to go and find evidence that water had once been there. Yeah. So Sojourner, the first rover in 97, was basically, will a rover work? So, mm -hmm. and it did. So then they said, okay, now we want to follow the water, which is sort of NASA's policy on how they do science on the surface of Mars. Mm -hmm. So the Mars exploration rovers are there to try to find evidence for that water. Spirit landed, opened up, took photos all around itself. It landed in the middle of a volcanic plain. The basalt everywhere, not, basically nothing that would tell you that water had once been there. Mm -hmm. so, hmm. so Spirit basically landed in the worst possible place <laughs> nice. that it could have. And I don't want to say that there was disappointment from that, um, but Spirit ended up having a much harder life uh, than Opportunity did because... When they opened up the petals and they took all the photos inside of Eagle Crater, which is where Opportunity landed, uh, literally on the other side of the crater, bedrock, with influence of water in it. Nice. So they literally drove like 15 meters to get the evidence of exactly what they needed. So, so Opportunity was just super lucky in where it landed at. You know, that's that I, that kind of luck is just. Fantastic, that's and that's kind of what happened with Opportunity because uh -huh. you know Spirit had a lot of parts break down, and it really had to fight for all the science that it did. Uh, Spirit did end up finding uh, evidence of hydrothermal activity on the surface of Mars, which mm -hmm. is really cool. So Absolutely. we know that there was water and a source of energy. And uh, Curiosity ended up finding schnapps, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur. So uh, so. 
Spirit went to an area where the three things that life needs were present um, there, um, but uh, but you know it broke down and then it got stuck and then it died in 2010. Um, but Opportunity was able to drive over um, literally an entire distance of a marathon, so wow. over 26 miles. Wow. Uh, I mean that's a lot if you think about it. It is. So, it really um, is. It's a lot for a mission that was only supposed to last for 90 days, three months. And we got 14 years out of opportunity. So that's impressive. Like, I know people who went through multiple cars in that time period, you know. <laughs> I so, learned how to drive yeah. in that day. So if, <laughs> if any of us are interested, uh, we happen to have some old footage of the launch. Yes. It's not even on 35 millimeter, although it probably should be. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if it, and the Five, best part is that Ben showed four, me this last night, three, and I was like, Wait, two. when did this Maybe launch again? 2003. And lift off. Yeah, July of 2003. Look at that, huh? Did they launch on the same and rocket the and then they separated later in orbit? Or oh, no, uh, each Mars separate. exploration rover launched on their own rocket. So, yeah, they got their own rocket. <laughs> that's a Delta II in the heavy configuration with the really big solids on it there. Big ground start solids, so. So the the part that I was freaking out about was that you can see up in the upper right hand corner there. I forget if that's the uh, chiclet or the bug, but it's one of those things. It says NASA TV, um, but you will notice it is not in the shape of a meatball. Mm -hmm. It is also not in the uh, '80s fantastic NASA worm logo. It's just very. It's probably Helvetica, honestly. It just says NASA TV, and I was like, wait. Seriously, how old is this? Well, I mean, they used Helvetica on the space shuttle, so it makes sense. No, it it so. it makes. Perfect sense. I was just really confused. I'm like, apparently I was not following any space things during this time period. <laughs> um, at some point, uh, we also get to see a little bit of their uh, mission control, I believe it is. And uh, I about died. Oh, there's the air starts. Mm. So and there go the ground starts. It really starts. is beautiful. Night, yeah. night launches are gorgeous. Yeah, I had a friend who was at this launch, and he said that uh, from the position he was watching it at, it took, it launched, and then it arced out, and it headed towards Mars in the sky. Hmm. Um, so it was rather, rather prophetic. <laughs> so with that there. All right, I want to see Mission Control, because you said that this is like... It's so, like, 1950s, 60s, like... Has everybody got pocket protectors? Just about. Oh. Like, you you know it's not the 50s because not every white dude who's in there, old white dude, by the way, uh, is not wearing <laughs> a white shirt, button-down shirt. Uh, some of them are wearing a couple of colors, but I'm, <laughs> I'm serious, man. Like, I looked at that and I was like, I clearly have no concept of when this is at all. <laughs> Yeah, no, this Delta II was a, a three-stage Delta II. So they had the uh, they had the solids and the fir first stage core, and then the second stage with it, and then a, a uh, solid third stage as well. So, uh, so this was about as souped up as a Delta II rocket gets. Um, and yeah, t you know, chucking a payload to Mars. So just another you know typical Thursday. Ah, uh, I just got a uh, a note in the host chat room uh, that. It's the provider that offered that, uh, not the official font. Yeah, got <laughs> gotcha. it. Gotcha. There go your boosters. <laughs> Wait, so they had solids that lit on the ground and then solids that lit in the air? Yes. Crazy, right? Huh. Does anyone else do that? I don't think so. If I recall correctly, I don't think anybody else did that at that time. I want to say, but that was back, this was back in 2003, so. Um, and Dutta, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, with this version of the Delta, uh, Delta II, I almost said Delta IV Heavy, um, with this version of the Delta II, it had nine solids, three start on the ground, and then six start in the air, if I remember correctly, or is it six, six on the ground and three the, in the air? Six start on the ground, three start in the air. Uh, oh. This one used the GEM 46, which is a 46 inch uh, solid. Uh, Spirit only had, wasn't the heavy configuration, it only had 40 inch boosters. All right, well there you go. Thank you, Dada. Also, you will notice like way back in the day, look at these cameras that are on the frickin' vehicle. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's fair. Right? Like, pretty much the whole way up. Yeah. Like that's 
gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 480p, but I mean, it still looks great. <laughs> hey, whatever. <laughs> so, it was, that looks great. Back in the day, that was the thing. Wait, what? They just need some on-screen graphics and they'll be fine. <laughs> oh, wow. Maybe like a vertical timeline? Yeah, yeah. that's the right to the stage. Yeah, it's oh, nice oh. to see cameras that I'm don't so cut sorry. out. I'm getting another note uh, in the host room. Uh, it's 480i. Oh, 480i, excuse me. Uh, Interlaced, well, not Well, I'm just going to say, it's nice to see cameras during a launch that don't cut out. It's nice to see just about <laughs> anything, honestly. <laughs> Wow! No, there was static. You can you can shush your mouth with that Don't one. Shut down on stage one. See static. Not saying. Yeah, just but saying. I mean you know. Yeah. Let's oh see. my gosh! This is what I'm talking about. Holy moly! What is this? What is happening right now? Wow, dude, Santa Claus is running that stuff. Like I don't know what's happening wow, anymore. Got them all the way from the North Pole, dude. In in July, but look, it looks of like all they're times. flipping switches. Yeah. Like there aren't even screens in there. That's why I was like, wait, when did this go? <laughs> Quick, we need to switch these cables. <laughs> That's how it felt. Throw the third switch. <laughs> Press the red button, dude. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they let's see. it out as they do it. Loopy Dragon says, uh, that's LC or Launch Complex 17 Blockhouse. Uh, Delta 2 was controlled from a building just a few hundred feet from the pad. Okay, so Blockhouse, which typically means that they're uh, concrete reinforced, uh, sometimes underground. A bunker, basically. Yeah, a bunker. A which, bunker that can take the hit. Dude, of the, crazy yeah. though, right? Could I was you looking at that being like, in you there and must... like, we need the code. 13, 34, dude. <laughs> You know, unreal. <laughs> there, so. Amazing. Absolutely yeah, yeah. amazing. That was, that was a nice blast from the past there. Totally, so, totally, that'd totally. Be cool. <laughs> vintage. Yeah, it's vintage dated. So. Amazing. <laughs> amazing. And I bet the blockhouse still looks like that. Uh, it's probably sealed because of asbestos, um, <laughs> to be fair. So, uh, so uh, switching gears a little bit, Ultima Thule. Oh, yes. yes. Right? So uh, right around uh, New Year's, right? Yeah. Miss Lisa here did an awesome, uh, and well, Jared joined, and like mm -hmm. we had a lot of people. Athena yeah. was calling in. I know somebody earlier was asking about Athena. She'll be back next week, by the way. Um, uh, did a really amazing, like, overnight sensation of the Ultima Thule flyby, uh, this lovely snowman in the sky. Yeah. We, there you go. Look at that. <laughs> wow. Um, so here it is now, Jan 26, or 26 of Jan <laughs> yes. 2019, yes. as it were. Uh, and we're starting to get some stuff back, mm -hmm. right? We're starting to get some pictures, some data, some something, but like only something. Yeah, so yep. the images, which I believe that's the one up there, uh, are getting pretty crispy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're starting to discern some really interesting surface features. Um, so that's what we started with. And uh, it's a little bit reddish, you know. And Natural color exactly. in this, by the way. Absolutely, so. Right. yeah. So, Jared, do you want to explain perhaps where that reddish color is coming from? Or that's oxidation, sure. right? Yeah, so it's kind of oxidation. It's from what we from what we understand with these these kite propelled objects, um, especially what we learned from Pluto and the flyby of Pluto, which New Horizons did, you know, three and a half years before this, um, is that if you expose certain ices to ultraviolet radiation, it'll redden them. Exactly. And that's basically what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so yeah, uh, we don't Tholins, right? we, we we don't know if it is Tholins or okay. not yet because they haven't released any data about the composition of Ultima exactly. Thule. So, uh, so we don't know. We have some cool photos yeah. to, to yeah. guess upon. So, I mean, this is like this is similar to one of the reasons we call Mars the red planet, right? Like it's the same. No, 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 no. Mars uh, is rusty. Yeah, Mars, is, Mars is iron oxide, which is like similar to rust. Uh -huh. uh, and this, Ultima Thule is just this is, uh, in bad know, lighting. It's like a byproduct of the reaction of um, what is it in the what is it that um, is on, on Pluto? It's methane exactly. reacting with the ultraviolet light, and then the particulates that kind of yeah, and then it rains down. out as like acetylene and ethane and other things like mm -hmm. that down to the surface. It's really weird Those how, some words how all this carbon and hydrogen just like snaps together and well it's not weird it's science um, <laughs> oh, and then it just oh. rains down sometimes to the, science snows. is weird yeah uh, okay. but but it's uh, it's bizarre because uh, you know we don't we don't know what type of ice it's made out of yet um, 
if okay. we look at Pluto, um, you know, Pluto had a lot of nitrogen ice, methane ice, uh, carbon monoxide mm -hmm. ice, carbon dioxide ice, and water ice on its surface. Um, but this is significantly smaller than Pluto. Exactly. Um, from basically tip to tip of the lobes there, it's about 34 kilometers in size. So not particularly big, um, mm -hmm. but, uh, but large enough that it's going to yield enough data that we should have a good understanding of it. So. Okay, and we're getting some of that data back now or no? Yes, yeah. So right after the flyby, there was a solar conjunction, which basically means that, that it went on the other side of the sun, mm -hmm. and we couldn't talk to New Horizons because there's this big ball of plasma in the way. So um, annoying. Rude. Yeah, rude. So annoying, yeah. Rude. Um, so, uh, so we had to wait until it came out on the other side of the sun uh, in, just a couple weeks ago, uh, mm -hmm. and then start getting the data down. So. Mm -hmm. But it's taking a really long time. It takes a very long time, in fact. Um, much slower than the old internet connections. Yes. And, uh, but uh, similar to New Horizons, you know, once this data starts pouring in, the revelations are probably going to be pretty exciting. Um, this is the furthest, most distant object we have flew past. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, what's going to be really interesting is kind of studying how bodies like this basically exist out there in the far reaches of the solar system, mm -hmm. um, so far away from the sun's influence in terms of for instance, when you get a comet that mm -hmm. ends up flying, not flying, but ends up coming along by the sun, you get a lot of outgassing, you get a lot of um, ices subliming and whatnot. However, this is so far out that this is literally kind of like a snapshot of what the solar system might have been like in its earliest days of formation. Um, it's basically like a time capsule because it really yeah. hasn't changed since the beginning of the solar system because it's been preserved basically cryogenically, mm -hmm. like Mr. Freeze. Yeah, and um, <laughs> you know, uh, with Pluto, you can't do that because Pluto is not the right kind of object for us to understand the origin of the solar system with. And same, you know, to kind of piggyback on the comments with, the, with, with comets. Um, so, uh, you know, we studied a lot of comets like Vil2, Temple 1, mm -hmm. Hartley, uh, Borelli, Chulurimov, Gerasimenko, like a whole bunch of comets uh, have been studied. But the chemical interactions with the sun basically doesn't completely ruin all of the things that have been there since the formation of the solar system, but it changes them enough that it we does. don't have a, we can't like definitively say whether that was there or not. We could exactly. say this is what happened in the evolutionary history of this comet in its nucleus here, but but nothing like uh, Ultima Thule, which is what's called, what's known as a classical cold Kuiper belt object. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? That basically means that it orbits in the ecliptic of the solar system. So there's a plane that most of the material of the solar system formed in, in this disk of material. And some of the, some of the objects went out of that plane, like Pluto. Mm -hmm. Pluto is not a classical cold Kuiper belt object okay. because it is, tilted. it is tilted quite significantly compared mm -hmm. to the ecliptic um, of the solar system. And these classical cold Kuiper belt objects are you know within the plane of the solar system, and they've interacted with Neptune's gravity enough that they basically stay far enough away from the sun that they're never touched um, by its by the solar winds uh, being the primary influence. Now, ultraviolet radiation, sure, yeah, that's very clearly done some work on the surface there, mm -hmm. um, but that's that's not enough to ruin the preservation of the material that's there. Huh. Um, so yeah, so this is this is unbelievably exciting. Um, you know, to really kind of get this snapshot of uh, what the solar system was like in its infancy, when it was that nebulous cloud before uh, before everything formed fully, and and uh, you know, with New Horizons, they're hoping to find an even further out Kuiper Belt object to try to study that as well, mm -hmm. um, and they're going to hope, hopefully get that mission proposal in this summer. Um, and and as far as I understand, um, even though New Horizons is is sending data in its downlinks um, when they have to take breaks because the Deep Space Network, you can't hog the Deep Space Network. Exactly. Other missions want to talk and get their <laughs> data down um, during these periods when they're not uh, downloading. Mm -hmm. They're aiming their uh, long long range imager. I think it's Lore, called Lore. Uh, they're aiming it in the direction that they're flying to try to find objects. Mm -hmm. So they're already working on trying to find something else to fly past even yeah. further out. Well, so. they got it. I mean, that thing is traveling so fast now at a mm -hmm. rate of, uh, what is it? Now it's it's up to how many kilometers per second? Uh, I think it's somewhere like, along the order, order of 12 kilometers per second. I was going to say, second. I think it's up to 12 now because it was about 10 It's not in my notes, so I can't tell you. Yeah. 
It's moving really quick. So <laughs> fast enough that a dust grain would basically obliterate, Hold vaporize us. it, essentially. <laughs> so yeah, and that's another thing that they're doing out there too. They're, it's not just the flyby of Ultima Tilly that they're working on. They're also taking in like radiation data, mm -hmm. dust count data, and other things like that in an area that uh, that this level of resolution in these instruments has never been done before. Like sure, the two Voyagers sent data from this area, um, but you know that's 1970s technology. That's not early. That's not uh, early 2000s technology like New Horizons is. So, <laughs> and you know what was it? LC17. Technology. <laughs> that was really, really yeah. amazing. Awesome. Well, okay, so for those of you who may have forgotten, uh, we this is our space show, but we also have a science show today. We do. Mm -hmm. So which is really which is why we're wearing the science shirts. Uh, so what we're gonna do now is I'm going to give a huge thank you to all of our supporters. I'm gonna start off with the, our Escape Velocity citizens. These people give us $10 or more per episode, and they help us do lots and lots and lots of things. In fact, there are more things coming at you, and I will talk about that in the next slate, which is the Orbital Citizens. These people have given us $5 or more per episode. One of the wonderful things that you help us do is not just maintain uh, having this set and all of our very fast and apparently very stuttery internet this week, um, but you also help us do things like, well, and the suborbital citizens as well help us to $2.50 or more per episode. Obviously, you all get your names in the show. Um, what you also help us do is have the space show as well as the science show, and then have things like the news segment that is kind of busted out onto its own thing that lets us have our, our own commentary show. New Year's uh, live streams. Exactly. Oh, yes, yes, New Year's live streams. Then there's also the ground support citizens that are uh, a dollar or more per episode. And uh, I, I, there literally is a note in here that says, allow enough time for everyone to be able to find their names. All of you people, <laughs> of course, help this make help make this show happen. And we very much so could not be doing this without you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very happy it's, this is out of my house. I will say that much. And I have a very comfy <laughs> chair to sit on. So thank you for all of those things. And really, honestly, thank you for supporting us. I know we've been doing a lot of changes lately. And everyone's had a lot of opinions. And we have read every single one of them, and we've tried to respond to them as best we can. Um, but we continue to like to know, we continue to like to know your feedback. Um, there are also other ways you can help the show. You can subscribe, you can like hit the little bell on mm -hmm. YouTube. We have an entire community of yeah. community on community.tmro.tv. Mm -hmm. um, again, lots of opinions over there and a lot of really yeah. interesting, sometimes off topic things. There's an mm -hmm. entire thread about coffee. Yeah. I still don't know why, so, but that's cool. There's an entire thread <laughs> about, uh, about like homemade projects you've done. Yes, so, really like, cool. So like me and Dada have said like, yeah, we built rockets before. Take a look, you know. Right. So and people have like shown off their art that they've made. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, with that, and people have shown off the the 3D printing stuff that they've done. Yep. You know, it's just really cool that we have this community of people that's like not only just really engaged, but incredibly creative and like willing to throw that out there to kind of show off to everybody. You know. Absolutely. So, that's really really cool. So, so like I said, we read every single comment, please continue to leave them. Um, we want to be able to respond and, and, you know, and really chat with you. That's, mm -hmm. this is your show. We yeah. are just here to entertain yeah. you. I mean, we, <laughs> we, you literally voted for a story that we talked about today, so. Which is I mean, what we're going to continue to do. Yeah. So uh, the new segment will be coming up uh, a little bit later, or this coming week, I suppose, mm -hmm. today is Saturday. Mm -hmm. And then uh, and then whichever one that you want us to talk more on or you want to hear our opinions on, please vote for that one, and then it will go into the next show. But right now, we're going to close out, do a little bit of an after dark, and then see you guys up in science. Bye. Peace. Thank you.